our soul, Lord Father. Cleanse our soul, Lord Father. Come and take control in our life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord Nazareth. Father, forgive us, O Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let us ask for the blood of Jesus to come and wash us, to remove every spot in our garment, to remove anything that the enemy can use to condemn us. Let us ask for the blood of Jesus to come and cleanse us in this hour in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, Lord Jesus, Father, I ask for the blood of Jesus, Father, to come and purify, O oh Lord, Father, to sanctify us, O oh Lord Jesus, Father, to come and remove every spot in our garment, everything that is not pleasing you in our men. Father, come and take control in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, cleanse us, our soul, body, spirit, O oh Lord Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, come and cleanse us, O oh Lord, Father, to purify our soul, body, spirit, O oh Lord, Father, our house, O oh Lord, Father, the next dog that we're going to use, O oh Lord, Father, purify it, O oh Lord, Father, the blood of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let us invite the presence of God in our midst. God to come and take control, to come against any power of darkness that want to block our ears, not to hear the word of God that is going, we're going to hear today. We are going to pray to come against every power of darkness in our midst. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we call for your presence in our midst, O Lord, Father. The Bible says we are true, free are gathered, you are there. Father, come and take control. Any power of darkness that want to come and into our prayer, turn to make us, O Lord, Father, not to follow, not to hear. Father, we destroy it in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us open our mic and pray, my sister. We are here to, to mute our mic. Father, we come against every power of darkness that you want to make us, Father, not to concentrate, not to be the follower and the doer of the word of God. Father, Father, let like destroy by the power, by the thunder of the Holy Spirit, Father, come and destroy them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ on us. Father, destroy the works of the enemy. Father, we come against every power of darkness, Father, destroy them, O Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh -huh, right. okay, no, you can take yeah. All right, thank you. All right, let's continue. Amen. Satan is a liar. Amen. Let's continue to pray. Let's begin to plead the blood of Jesus over the internet, over our gadget, over the environment, over our phones, over everything we are going to do in the name of Jesus. And let's begin to plead the blood of Jesus. The Bible said they overcome by the blood of the Lamb by the words of their testimony. Every powers in the devil is in there. Wherever they have gathered against this gathering, every internet demons, every network failure, let's begin to bring them all that subjection in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's open our mother and pray. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we overcome every power of that by the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we silence their works and their activities in the name of Jesus. In any way, oh God, they have gathered against us this hour. Any way they have risen against us, let them be silenced by fire in the name of Jesus. Every territorial demons, every network demons, every powers in the air police, powers and jackers, every person to attack our network, to attack our gadget, let them be silenced by fire in the mighty name of Jesus. We paralyze every stronghold of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We bring the works to mortar by the power in the the blood of Jesus will subdue every strange power, every territorial demon has ever met a force in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At uh, this hour, we want to commit the servant of God into the hands of God that as we go into this study, let God make our heart a fertile ground that as his word will come this hour, his word will be fruitful in our lives. We will not just gather in vain, we will not just come for the number's sake, but we shall be the doers of God's word. We will hear his word and he will sink into us in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, our God, we pray in the name of Jesus that we will hear your word, O Lord, and knock unto your word. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Use your servant mightily to minister unto us in the mighty name of Jesus. We will not just be hearers only, but the doers of your word in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, Lord, King of God, as your word will be ministering to us tonight. We will not just come here to come and give numbers, but rather, Lord, King of God, your word will sink into our lives and will be fruitful hearers and doers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for all the prayers. Thank you for this evening. We cover our prayers, the blood of Jesus. We seal it up by fire in the name of Jesus. Everything we do, we soak it in the pool of the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we have prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless us. I welcome every one of us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are welcome to the presence of your Father. Get your pen, your notes, your writing materials. At this hour, I'll be welcoming our pastor, Pastor C.Y., as he will be teaching tonight. God bless you, Salvatore.
Thank you, God bless everyone of us in the name of Jesus. Let us to pray together in Jesus' name. Our Father, we thank you again this evening. We, our eyes and you, Lord, we ask, Father, that you will give us the dish, the diet, Lord, what we need for the hour release upon our hearts in the name of Jesus. Whatever Lord to steal your seed in our heart, we took them and we command them to crumble in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that our eyes of understanding will be open. You will grow of us and you cause your glory to be established upon our lives. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we are starting from where we start. Remember, we are discussing delegating tasks and developing people. Delegating tasks and developing people. We've gone quite a long way. But today we'll be looking at how we develop others while delegating the ministry. How do we develop others? Why delegate the ministry? I want to quickly say here that part of the crisis we're facing today is a wide gap between this generation and the upcoming generation. And also perhaps why the church has faced the chaos, the current and the present chaos is because when Revival, the last revival that broke out that ended, um, that ended with the 80s, or just trickled in the early 90s. Why it broke and ceased was because there was no continuity. And we have seen this repeating itself. The, the, the fragments of godliness we have today may soon vanish into the air without um without the cover up because we now have a wide gap between what we have today and the generation that have been captured by strange spirits strange men and women who have taken over the altar until the remnant today realizes the need to begin to empty their lives into ready-made young men and women to carry on in Jesus tariffs, then there will be no hope for tomorrow. So when I believe and I trust that the Lord will use this platform to charge us up, to see the need, to grow passionately, to see the need to make sufficient and deliberate sacrifice to ensure that our life, you know, a transit into those coming behind us. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So we're looking at how to develop others. Number one, know yourself. Know yourself. I be familiar with the strengths in the world. We must be familiar with the strengths that we have on us, which are passing on to others. And I like us, we have a lot of Bible passages I have um, marshaled out for us to uh, brood over Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18. My to do this. Okay, I'm going 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 Can you read for us? Nehemiah chapter 2. 
Sister Abigail, uh, um, Sister Ito, uh, you're moderating. Please tell them to 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 unmute their their contacts so they can we can all hear ourselves. I want so many people to participate today by reading. Nehemiah two eighteen. Can I read? Yes, please. Nehemiah 2.18, I read. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this work, good work. Verse 19. But when Shambhala... No, that's okay. Just, All right. just verse 18. Okay, thank you. Now, so the first thing we are saying is that we must know ourselves what strength we put, which we intend to pass on to others. The reference we have here, Nehemiah had come with a great vision, with a great body, a vision born out of great body and passion for the city of Jerusalem. And when, Jeremiah, when Nehemiah came, he was communicating his vision to them. And he came to this point and he said, Today, he said, um, this 18 we just read, he told them of the hand of my God, which has been good upon me. I think that's an enormous strength. We, we need to know what strength we have. The moment you do not realize that you have strength in you, then you don't see the need to transfer something to someone around you. What are the virtues in us? The man knew that the hand of the Lord was strong upon him. And because the people realized that there was a divine strength upon him, they quickly, they wrote, the Bible said, so they said, let us rise up and build. So there was a transfer. Nehemiah knew himself. The man knew he didn't just come all alone. He didn't come out of his own ideology. He didn't come out of his human thinking or, you know, just a mere desire to get something done. He knew that God sent him. He knew that the God who sent him had this mighty and great and good hand upon his life. And that was why he was ready to walk with them. And they saw it. And they said, let us rise up because we know that this man has something in his life. So let's know that we have the hand of God that is mighty upon our life. And because of that, God is desiring for us to communicate what we have, to impart what we have, to raise our hands upon men and women who are prepared to contact the glory and the virtue in our lives. Number two, know the person you wish to develop. Identify his or her strength and weaknesses. There is need for us to know who we want to develop. Number chapter 27, verse 12, is a long one. Number chapter 27, someone get ready to read for us. Number 27 from verse 12 to 23. Numbers 27, from verse 12 to 23. Numbers Someone 27. please take it up for us. Numbers, 20, Numbers 27, verse 12 to 23. And I read in Jesus' name. And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount, Abarim, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shall be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water for their eyes. That is, the water of Meribah in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord 
the God of the spirits of all flesh set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar, the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honour upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar, the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took, he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar, the priest, and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Thank you. So we are looking at identifying who we wish to develop. Now I like to say here that in the case of God, men and uh, the duties and responsibilities of the kingdom. We, we know that prior to this point, Joshua had voluntarily stayed close to Moses. Joshua offered himself, he was very close, in spite of the fact that um, Aaron was one man that God said to Moses, this is your brother, um, he's going to be a mad piece. But here Joshua voluntarily began to you know, follow Moses as Moses was walking closely with God. Here comes the point where God wanted to take Moses away, preparing to take Moses away. And there was a need for a continuity. Moses knew that someone stay in his place. Moses didn't know to you. Moses, rather Moses, the Bible said, Moses spoke to the Lord saying, that's verse 15, let the Lord, the God of the spirit of all flesh, sit a man over the congregation who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no sheep. So Moses requested from the Lord, Lord, who do I develop? Can I tell you, brethren, that part of the problem we have is that we have lack this that man who is that woman you would like me to raise in my place. Who are you giving to me? Rather, it is the reverse. We bring someone, we say, Lord, I bring me. No, we just ask the Lord. We don't, we don't seek for his presence. We don't seek for his permission. Because of that, we lack full knowledge of that man, of that woman, who we are pouring our lives into. And before our eyes, we see the world being messed up because we were not diligent to ask the Lord to show us who we may. Because he said, Moses said to the Lord, you are the God of all spirits. He knows all men. He knows much more than we do. Moses didn't take for granted that Joshua had been a boy under him and apprentice under him. But he said, you are the God of all spirits who knows all men. Though I know Joshua, but you know him better. And the Lord said to him, get Joshua. The Lord said to Moses, take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man whom is, who is the spirit 
a man in whom is the spirit. So the Lord knew. And I think it's very important for us as we do the work of God. Let's seek to know who we are bringing to pour our lives into, who we're delegating a responsibility. Don't pick any hammer. Don't just pick anyone that someone is speaking in tongues. This seems to be a suitable person. But then go to God in prayer and ask the Lord, who is this man that speaks in tongues? Who is this lady that prophesied? Who is this one that seems to be a mighty man? Seek to know who the person is so that the work of the Lord will not be in, you know, in, in, in distress. The tournament of the third two. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Let's get a clearer picture of this issue we are raising. Deuteronomy 31 from verse 8. Let's dig deeper into this point. So can I have someone to read for us, please? Deuteronomy chapter 31, 1 to 8. Let's make it fast. First place, because we have a lot of things to cover today. Please let someone read for us. Deuteronomy 21, right, sir? 31, 31. 31 verse what? Okay, I read in Jesus' name. One to eight. Sorry? Go ahead. From verse what, sir? One to eight, one to eight. From verses one to verse eight. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said unto me, Thou shalt thou Thou shalt not go. Or thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, He will go over before thee, and He will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said, and the Lord shall do unto them as He did in Shion and to all king of the Amorites and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Cease, be strong and be of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he, it is that doeth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with these people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doeth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we're looking at, we're still considering um, the need to know, the identify, He's, in addition to what we just highlighted, we saw that Moses spoke to the children of Israel and challenged them the need to be strong and to be courageous and that the presence of the Lord will certainly go with them. But he singled out Joshua, whom the Lord has commanded him and said, take Joshua, present him before the priest of Nazar, that he will lay his hand upon him. He singled out Joshua. What did he say to him? Moses called Joshua and said to him, and the sight of all people, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with the people to the land where the Lord has sworn. You see, 
We would pick a man and a woman who want to delegate responsibility. Let's envisage that that individual does not have all the capacity you know, to handle the challenges. There's, you don't have a giant. You don't have you know, um, a man who do not have defaults or weaknesses in him. There's a need for us to bring before the notice that there is need for them to, to be courageous, to be strong, in anticipation for, you know, um, sudden challenges that might come. So just Moses recognized this. When we pick someone to, to, you know, we want to develop, let's ask the Lord to help us to have a complete, a proper assessment of who the person is, what are their weaknesses, what are the strengths, so we know the area we need to speak to that individual uh, to put up strength and be able to stand strong to, to deliver. So they can, that individual can be big, better, stronger than us and be more achieving uh, you know, than, than we have done. Then number three, developing others while delegate the ministry, clearly define the assignment. Clearly define the assignment. So what we're saying here, don't leave anything in question, write it down. Write it down. There's need for us to be very clear, um, like Habakkuk tells us, write the vision, make it clear, so that anyone who reads, let him understand it. So we need to make a very clear you know, definition of the assignment we're delegating somebody to, and as clear as they can understand it. This is very, very important. Um, after knowing the person's strength and their weaknesses. Then number four, number four, teach the why behind the assignment. Let them know why it is important. We need to let the person know whatever we're delegating an individual to do, we need to let them know why that assignment is very important. Why? And the importance of that responsibility. So they can put in their best to it. Let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, this time verse 17. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. So he said, then I said to I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are born with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. This is the reason. This is the reason Nehemiah felt that this job needs to be done. He said, We are being a reproach. And we need to cease to be a reproach to the nations. So this is the reason why he said to them, we are in distress. Our Jerusalem lies in waste, and the gates are burned down. So let us build the wall of Jerusalem. So why are you delegating responsibility? Well, you are made it very clear. Well done. Um, a woman will clean up, you are going out, and you're expected to come in with some guests into the house. You ask her, your children to please clean up the house very well. I say to them, I'm coming in with guests in this house. So beyond our own confidence and comfort, we are getting visitors into this house. Let's let them know the reason why that has to be done. We take another look at this need Esther chapter 4 the book of Esther chapter 4 I'd like someone to open to read for us verse 1 to 3 then 7 to 14 Esther chapter 4 1 to 3 7 to 14 and someone please quickly read for us yeah. read when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his garment, his cloth, and put on sackcloth with ashes 
and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth and in every province with whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came there was a great mourning among the jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes verse 7 okay to verse 7 7 to 14 7 to 14 sir yes please and Kaya told him of all that had happened unto him and of the son of the money that Hama had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to shew it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make a supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And Hacha came and told Esther the word of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hacha and gave him commandments unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king's into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of is to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live, but I have not been called to come in unto the king's these 30 days. And they told, and they told to Mordecai Esther's word. Then Mordecai they commanded to, to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's heart more than all Jews. For if thou all together holdest thy peace at this time, then shall dear enlightenment and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whither thou art come to the king to the kingdom for such a time as this? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Now for every duty, every delegation or responsibility, there's a task. The Jews were faced with a decree of annihilation. And Mordecai quickly responded by mobilizing, you know, the people, they were willing and they were weeping. And he sent a message across to Esther, who was already living in comfort at the palace. And it's us, he enjoined Esther to rise up to the occasion. And here Esther was trying to excuse herself because of the law, which is already on the ground that you cannot get into the, the you know, before the king without an invitation because the consequence is there. But Mordecai was asked to draw her attention to the fact that it could be the reason why God brought her to the palace at such a time as that. And that was a challenge to Esther. The moment we realize and understand the reason why a task needs to be done, I think we have more sense of commitment to it. There's need for us to let people know, don't just delegate responsibility. Let them understand why it has to be done the you know the consequences if they are not properly done and what are going to be the gains if they are properly done these are need needed
to be communicated to whoever we're delegating responsibility if we want a better result. And we saw that Esther rose up and the Jews were saved. The Lord rose up because somebody was ready. Somebody understood that if they don't act, Nemesis will befall on them. If we do not let people understand why they must take out replication and what the need for them to get it properly done, we may not have the kind of result that we desire in our lives. The number, number five, discuss the growth process as you go. Discuss the growth process as you go. Talk about how do we grow from it. So when we delegate responsibility, we must also let the people know what is needed for their growth because they don't need to remain taunted. They need to develop. We were once novice when we were engaged into the various ministry. Some of us who have grown to become pastors today will remember, yes, but we're just uh, mere members of the fellowship. We're just brought into a group with a leader and gradually we rose, became Sunday school teachers, Bible study, began to lead, ushers, and all of that. Today, we have become. We went through a process of growth. So we need to discuss with the people what are those things they need to necessitate their growth. Now, let's look at Numbers chapter 27 and see what Moses communicated to Joshua. Numbers chapter 27, verse 18 to 21. Numbers 27, 18 to 21. Numbers chapter 27. If you are there first, please read for us. From 18 to 21, sir. Yes, please, sir. Yeah. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay thy hand upon him and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a child in, the, in their sight and thou shalt put some of thy honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may, may be obedient and he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall ask who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord at his word shall they go out and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Praise the Lord. So 21. Thank you. Yeah, 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 21, you got it. Thank you. Now, this is a very beautiful one. Charging to the people with courageous. Listen to what, what happened here. It said to him, before God and before to you, taking them out and bringing them in. He said, you need to hear from God. You need to constantly hear from God. And he said to him, the only way you're going to hear from God is that you will stand before a laser, the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for you. Can you hear that? So you need a priest. Joshua, if you're going to grow in this ministry, you need to hear from the Lord. You need that God will continue to speak to you to give you directives. You need instruction from the Lord. And the only way God is going to speak to you, as far as this time is concerned, you need this man, the priest called Eleazar, who will inquire on your behalf from the Lord. So imagine if Eleazar wasn't there. Imagine if the Lord does not speak, then the words of Joshua will amount to futility. So it behoves on us, brethren, that when we raise men and women, we want to delegate because we want them to succeed us 
We want them to grow better than all. We want to see the world prosper much more than we have done. Then we need to seek from the Lord. Lord, what do they need to grow? It is our duty to grow them into understanding what they need to grow. This is a responsibility because we've been there. What were those things we did that made us successful? Let's hand it over to them. And that's what the Bible says here. Joshua, sorry, Moses said to him, and um, yeah, the Lord said to Moses, verse 18, tell Joshua the son of Nun, with you a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your head on him, setting before Eleazar the priest and before the congregation, and inaugurate him um, in the side. Verse 20, and you shall give him some of your authority. So Moses was to release some of his authority to him. Why? Because Moses was not yet taken away. Moses was still actively before the Lord. Then um, he needed to tutor Joshua to grow a lot. He needed to mentor him. So for him to be able to connect to what Moses was doing, he needed some of the authority in Moses to be able to grow along with him. So these are some of the things on Wednesday we're talking about what some level of control and authority we must relinquish to the people we're growing. This has made it very clear for us that we need to bring them along with us so they can grow until they are able to take over and preach the God. Number six, spend relational time with them. Invest time when you are not talking about work. So here, we need to have some time of leisure where we need to connect, where we need to develop relationship, intimate relationship with whoever we're bringing, we're growing the person, a time to socialize. We find that in Luke chapter 22, Jesus created this occasion and missed you know, his duty. Can we just look at Luke chapter 22 from verse 7 to 15? And I'd like somebody to read for us Luke chapter 22 from verse 7 to verse 15. Luke 27, 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house, where he entered in, and ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. So 14, sir. That's 15, 15, 15. Okay, so 15. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Okay. And relational time with them. No, that's okay. Relational time with them. So there is need for us. You see, whether you're delegating responsibility, very key responsibility. Um, that individual needs to have an attachment with you. You need to have attachment. Without mutual attachment, the best in your life cannot really be communicated to that individual. 
So Jesus spent some time and said, okay, let's go and eat the Passover together. And they drank. He drank and he gave to them. And they drank together. We, we, we know that in some other places, he, there, were, there were also occasions where he had to stay with his disciples. And they, they sat together and he told them parables. So let's learn once in a while whether you have um, consciously targeted to develop and to build up. Let such a one have some time. You can invite him or her to your house and just spend some time and ask the person some, some things you know, outside the, the, the duty, some things about the personal lives, build relationship. That's exactly what we're talking. The person will learn more, the person will be more, more committed to you know, the task, will be glad and see that it's not just about the work, but you also have interest in him or her life. Number seven, allow them to watch you minister. Allow them to watch you minister. Let them observe and get feedback from you. So this is also very key as we tend to um, transfer responsibility and duties to uh, those coming behind us. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 from verse 14 to 21. Pastor Teresa, could you please read for us? Matthew chapter 17, from verse 14 to 21. Pastor Teresa, please. All right, sir. 17, Matthew 17, I read from verse 14, I reckon. Okay. And, yes, when, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, on my son, for he is a lunatic and so vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. 16. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall by, nothing shall be impossible unto you. 21. How be it, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, and why they abode? God bless you, sir. Okay, that's all right. 21. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I love this. I love this. Um, as I went through this this afternoon trying to review today's lesson, and I saw this, you know, these uh, cases that we are referencing. Uh, when I got here, it was so clear to me that um, sometimes certain things are lacking from us. We could just be carried away with what we're doing and I'm mindful that those we're bringing up are struggling to understand what we're doing. So we find this case that they have struggled, they tried all to no avail, but just in a split second, the demon you know, was, was gone. And they were amazed, and they didn't pretend they went straight to Jesus and asked the Lord, why did we fail? What was our problem? So Jesus quickly told them, I said, look, you, you are faithless. That's the first thing. You don't have faith. Then he said to them again, there are some of these cases that you need to fast and pray before you can get rid of them. 
So there's need for us to allow those who are mentoring, those who are delegated responsibility, allow them to watch us, allow them to observe, and allow them to get back to us when they have done or when they have seen us do certain things. We should be accessible. We should be available and accessible. I mentioned this that day. So they could reach us and ask us questions. Now, why, why was it very easy for them to walk up to Jesus to ask him what their problem was? It was because they have had a very close relationship with him. It was not a, a boss-servant relationship. There was this closeness. They could talk to him. They could reach him. This is contrary to what we find today, where we have pastors, or we have bishops, we have general overseers, that we have bodyguards and members of their churches. And even when their younger pastors want to meet them, they begin to knock their knees and they are, you know, they are jittering how to communicate to them because it's going to bully on them and say, my friend, walk away. For all these years you've been here, you are asking me this. Can you just walk away from here? You are a disappointment of this ministry. You can hear this from some great men of God. But Jesus was there. They didn't struggle. They just walk and say, we struggle, Master. What happened to us? Then, you know, lovingly he said to them, you lack faith. You need faith. You also need, in your capacity, you need to fast and to pray to deal with this kind of situation. And I pray that the Lord will help us to be more sensitive and more deliberate in raising offspring. It could be our own children. You know, um, see my son driving me, and um, I was just directing you do this, you do this, and they said, Daddy, is it that you don't have confidence in me? Why? Why do you think that? I don't know what I'm doing. I say, well, it is my duty to continue to build you up. So he knew, he knew what he was doing. But in my own judgment, I felt he, he wasn't too right. That was the way I wanted him to, him to navigate a point. So, but because we he could be with a servant in quote. That servant can never be perfect before you. You will never see complete. Um, but we know that while we are away from them, we must have confidence that they're going to get back to us to give us feedback and say, well, this is what I did. You find where and where you think you need to make correction. But the truth is that let's create a room for this kind of feedback and let's allow them to watch us do it and they are going to grow exponentially they're going to grow tremendously we're going to see results we're going to be rejoicing to see us existing and give them the receipt provide the tools to do the job so go back to the book of Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Sister Chimoya, we're waiting for you, please. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 9, verse. I didn't get the verse, please. My network was breaking. Luke chapter 9, verse. What, sir, please? 1 and 2. 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Thank you. Then he called That's his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, Sister Patience, please could you read chapter 10? Chapter 10, verse 19. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 19, sir. Yes, please. Okay. I read in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and the scorpions, and over all the power of uh, the enemy, and the nothing shall by any means hurt you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. So, we are raising a very crucial issue here. Give them the resources and authority they need. We're talking about providing the tools to do the job. When we have delegated responsibility, we read earlier from number chapter 27 that Moses had to give some of his authority to Joshua. Here we find that Jesus himself equipped his disciples, he was to send out the 12, but he equipped them. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases and to heal the sick. He gave them, he equipped them. Now, whatever has made us to succeed in our ministry, in our endeavors, it is very imperative that we also give it as a resource to those we are raising behind us. When he asks us, how did you succeed? How did you get to where you are? Please don't hide anything because it will certainly not reduce who you are. Whatever has taken you to the peak of your life, don't hide it because God gave it to you liberally give it to others. Let's equip people with enough resources. Let's give them the tools. Let's create an environment for them. Let's let us make them understand how they are going to succeed in life. Because when they become great, we have also become great through their ministry. Responsibility that we owe intelligence and responsibility and developing people. Enough resources. If it is books we have read, let's tell them any kind of if it is a place of prayer, let's tell them how we pray. If it is a matter of integrity, let's tell them how we conducted ourselves. Let's tell them everything about our lives because it's an investment. Number nine. Encourage them to join us during the process. Encourage them to join us during the process. Help them interpret their growth. They need to understand their growth. They need to have a journal. They need to have record. They need to have a, a proper perspective of how they're growing, the measure of their growth. Maybe we can just look at chapter 10 of this and look, look chapter 10. Verses 17 and 18. Uh, Pastor Felix, I'm sure he's, he's here. Please, can you read for us? Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Pastor Felix, is Pastor Felix, sister? Our sister, to her place, sister, Pastor Felix, please help us. Tell you, we want you to read. Yeah. Verses 17 and 18. Luke 10, okay. 17, 18. Thank you, sir. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by enemy hurt you. 
Is it the same place? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's 17 and 18. 17 and 18. 17 and 18. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I read 17. Okay. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Thank Praise you. the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Now, so what I was saying, yeah, thank you. Now, Jesus needed to help them understand more properly the level of success they had achieved with what he committed them. He gave them power to go and, you know, to, as they went on to communicate the gospel, to preach the gospel, he gave them power to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and uh, all of that. So they came back and said, the demons subject to us in your name. As we bound them, we saw them that they humbled themselves. They were subject. Let me help you to understand what happened. Much more than what you knew. What, much more than what you observed. He said, look, I saw Satan fell like lightning from heaven. So when we have delegated responsibility and the process of feedback, we need to help them understand the measure of successes they are achieving. And that's going to gladden their heart. I can imagine how excited they were to hear Jesus say to them, Satan, the demons were not only subject, even Satan himself fell like lightning. I can imagine when you get you when you, you give a part of the back of somebody you are developing and say, This is great. I'm so excited. Do you know what you've just done? You've just done so great. In fact, beyond my expectation, you've done great something great. I'm proud of you. You have just kindled that spirit in that man, that woman, to do greater things. That person go back home and say, well, I think I can do much better. So something good is coming out of my life. We can grow people when we appreciate them, when we make them understand the, you know, the progress they are making. Number 10, hold them accountable for their ministry. Get permission to keep them in line. Well, I was watching, I needed to get something for us to understand, but we can understand this. We need to let the people to be accountable to their ministry, a challenge to them. We must let them know where they're going. Brother, sister, look, let me tell you, God is taking you very far away. You are just being ordained as an evangelist, a global evangelist. You are not just limited to this parish. I can see that God is taking you far away. So you need to be very prudent. You need to be very responsible. You need to build integrity because God is taking you far. So hold them accountable to their ministry. Get permission to keep them in line. And this is exactly what we owe them. Those we are raising, we must come into their life. Hold them accountable. Make sure that we guide them properly so that they can deliver. And it will be a great joy to see them succeed in life. Number 11, give them the freedom to fail. Give them the freedom to Then for reference, let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Um, Matthew chapter 14. Sister Justina, can you please read for us Matthew chapter 14? From verse 27 to 31. 27 to 31. I read in Jesus' name. Immediately, Matthew 14, 27. Immediately, Jesus speaks to them. Have, have courage, 
it is high, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, commanded me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and came out of the boat. Peter started walking on the, on the water and came towards Jesus. Should I continue? Verse 30. Okay, yeah, 31. Okay. So 31. 30. But when he saw, but when he saw the strength of the what of the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and crying out, Lord, save me. 31. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, stretched out his hand, caught him, hold, and said to him, You of little faith. Why did you doubt? Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. So here again we have a very striking, you know, revelation. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. Give them the freedom to fail. Jesus was walking on the water. They saw far away, and they were troubled. And say this is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But he spoke, hey, it is hard. Do not be afraid. So Peter, who was a restless, a restless you know, disciple, Peter made the ministry of Jesus more relevant than every other person. He asked all the questions. He was always there. He tried so many things. So Peter said, if you are the one, bid me come. Jesus knew that there was no way Peter could walk the way he was walking. So he needed to allow him to try it and watch him fail. Jesus could have said to him, Peter, you don't, just, you don't need to try because you can't make it. Just stay close, I'm coming to you. He said to him, come up. We are beckoning on Peter and say, Peter, what are you doing? Why you, you are risking your life? But he heard the word. And he responded. He walked out and stepped and began to walk on the sea. Jesus watched him. And suddenly when he looked down, he realized he was, he was walking on the water. An unconventional platform. The Lord stretched forth his hand and he lifted him up and said, Oh, why did you doubt? You little faith. Why did you doubt? You see, we must allow whoever we're delegating, whoever we're raising, let's allow them to make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, no matter how, how destructive that mistake is, because we're raising them up, let's accommodate them. Let's appreciate them. Let's tell them what they needed to do to avoid that mistake. So that next time they, they, won't, they won't have to fail again. We don't need to be bullies. We don't need to be you know, so aggressive in correcting them. Let's realize that we won't fail the way they are failing. So we must give them freedom. The word there is freedom. It is not to be taken for granted because of, of course you must let them know you must not continue to fail. You must grow above the level where you are. So let's allow them to fail and let's also let them learn through their failures. Lastly, number 12. The brief and affirm regularly. What we're saying, encourage them all along the way as they succeed. I encourage them. Luke chapter 10, verse 20, 21. Luke chapter 10, 20, 21. Sister Prosper. Luke chapter 10, 20, 21. Luke 10, from 20 to 21. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because 
your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seems good in that sight. Hallelujah. So 21. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you thought about it. Yes, thank you. So we're saying that we need to encourage them all along the way as they succeed. So we're fine here as we concluded this, um, this adventure that Jesus, you know, sent the disciples to um, in verse 20. Um, do rejoice in this that the Spirit is subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. So the Lord was encouraged and was also encouraging them. And so look what you've just done, where something great has happened. The Lord is, I'm so proud of you. Then in verse 21, the Bible says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, why was he rejoicing? Because now these men have been launched into the field. They have, this was the first time he was sending them out. He stepped back. The Lord launched out the first missionaries. And they went out. And he was imagining the kind of result they're going to come with. And when they came back, so says, and they came with testimony, the Lord rejoiced. I said, Father, thank you, because now I am not all alone. This man died in my state. So we must learn to rejoice along with them as they succeed, as we delegate responsibility, as we launch men into ministry, as we see them making some success and progress in life, Let's rejoice along with them. Even our own children, let's appreciate them. With the measure of success they are making, let's appreciate them. Jesus did this. And he said to the Father, Lord, I thank you because it has seemed good. The mysteries of the kingdom have been hidden to the wife, but you are released, given it now to reveal it to the birds. These were just ordinary fishermen. They were no scholars. They were not among the Pharisees and scribes. They were just mere men. But the Lord, it has pleased you to raise them. So we look at where we have one of our sisters. When our ministry started, and um, the same environment where our ministry started, when we started our ministry, this young girl came from the slum. She was just one of the whole from nowhere she started with a great wealth of potential and a great you know memorator the heavens open so I rejoice on her behalf to the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for this sister. She's married with children today. All from the slum. But the people God has given to us. I don't know where Joshua came from, but little did Moses, near the time Joshua was coming around, that Joshua was going to succeed him. We will never know who that man, that small boy, that small girl, we never know what land the Lord is going to take them to. Even our own children, we never know. So every point we see them making success, let's rejoice. Let's appreciate the Lord. Let's encourage them. Let's stretch our hands the more and take them along. They can go further than we have even done in our own lives. Praise the Lord. So I would like to, okay. Let's just run through this point, then we'll close for today, take a few 
um, in Christian. What would you do? What would Jesus do? We have read already Luke chapter 9, 1 and 2. That Jesus gave them a power and authority. Then he called the 12, he called the disciples together and gave them power and authority. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. We see in this passage that Jesus shared both responsibility and authority to succeed in our mission. We must share both our work and power with them, with the team. Jesus aimed to develop the disciples and he shared the work. He did not spend the majority of his time with the masses. He focused on training the disciples by not spending equal time with everyone, but more time with those who were ready to be trained. Jesus was able to multiply his ministry in about three years. So today, I do it while you watch. Two, we do it together. Three, you do it while I watch. Four, we evaluate. Then five, you do it while another watches. There is a process. The truth about developing people, nearly every lasting movement in history endured because the first group leaders reproduce the leadership and values into a second generation of leaders. It became a movement because it was about multiplication and not addition. Now we're going to continue from this um, in our next lesson so we can expand this. Praise the Lord. So like uh, mm -hmm. over an hour now. Let's do uh, yes, look some some questions or some contributions. Present. Hallelujah. Praise Master Jesus. If there's any one of us who have question or contribution, can we indicate in the chat? If you have question or something you want to contribute regarding the message of today. Is there anyone with questions or contribution? It seems, uh, can I say something? I was not here in the beginning, but it seems everyone understood it perfectly. So maybe that's why there's no questions. God bless each and every one of you. But um, in between, um, you mentioned a scripture about, um, I think it's in Luke, behold, I give you power over scorpions and nothing by any means shall hurt you. I listen to this scripture. And when we do it with, um, when we are engaged in ministry, sometimes someone say a word that's painful. Does that scripture apply to that word or sentence or attitude? That's my question to you, my brother. Let's come again. Let me get the question please. Yes, so she was uh, talking about the scripture that was quoted in the book of Luke. And she said, it said that beyond I give thee yes. power <laughs> to tread upon serpents and scorpions. So uh, in ministry, sometimes we have challenges and people who offend. Uh, so is, does that scripture apply to such situation also? <laughs> I, I will try to say, is it to, to refer to people as scorpions or whatever? Is that exactly? They may have attitude. They, they are not scorpions, obviously. They're human beings. But they, 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 their, their language may be okay. venomous. So I'm just saying, oh. yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Actually, um, I think by metaphor, we can, we can, there are people who actually demonstrate the characteristics of scorpions and serpents by the way they react, by the way they speak. And uh, we can quickly see that the spirit that is controlling them, maybe for that very moment, 
uh, I mean, school of the Spirit of God, because we saw that when Joshua, when Moses was presenting Joshua to the law, um, he wasn't actually presenting, he was asking the law, who do you want to, uh, that I should hand over to? The law said, take Joshua in whom the Spirit of the Lord so when a man and a woman is not demonstrating and living out the life of the Spirit of God, obviously some other strange spirit could have taken about and it is it, it, it would be wrong for us to address the spirit that is at work at that very moment. Excellent. Excellent. I thank you so much. Amen. God bless us. Sister Prosper, God bless you and this book. Yeah, praise the Lord. I want to ask a question um, concerning, for instance, when uh, a leader delegates, uh, will I say assignment now? Yes, maybe for instance, ask me to do something. Let me use myself as an example. So. I, Maybe I will be clear with the way I want to ask the question. And uh, I can say like, he asked me to lead maybe like Sunday school or Bible study. And when I finish it, he did not uh, give me any compliment as in to make me know if maybe there is area where I make a mistake that in case of next time I should know how to go about it, like as you explained. and. He, uh, he, know, he didn't even ask me the next time to do it again. Maybe at when he feel like again, he not asked me. So in that situation, how will I feel? Should I feel, uh, feel maybe this person don't want me to be doing this work or should I go to the leader and say, ah, uh, since the last time you asked me to do something and since then you have not delegate me to do again. Is there something wrong? I just want to know, sir. I don't know if my question is Very, very clear, a very important question. Yeah. Um, very often, we sometimes we can be irrational in our judgment, in our perception, when situations like this, because usually they occur most pastors, they, they have this kind of situation. They may not actually know that there is, I don't want to use the word conspiracy. Sometimes it could just be because when it becomes very ungodly, when an ungodly approach is being, um, is being you know, approached, um, it becomes a conspiracy. Now, you, there's need for patience. There's need for you to do a proper and um, an honest assessment of the personnel, the people around, the capacities that are available. For instance, if you are if you are featured on a Sunday and there was no compliment, you just finished and that was just the end. And you notice that. It, it does take him maybe several months. You are never given opportunity. And you discover that some of the opportunity for more than once, while you are there, you are never attended to again. Then you are, you are justified to walk up to the pastor and just passionately and humbly um, ask to know if the way you conducted the Sunday school or whatever the last time wasn't really to his own satisfaction because you notice that. So listen to him and say, well, the reason I couldn't have come, I just noticed that some other persons who have been coming over and over have been appearing for uh, several times. And the last time I was never given opportunity again, I wanted to just know. So um, I expect that that man of God will, will have the spirit of God to tell you the honest truth and say, yes, actually, um, I wasn't really satisfied. This is not the area for you to function. Um, I'm observing you to see which other area you are gifted, where you can perform. And you must take it if he has told you in love 
and he has told it sincerely. See it that he has gotten a better assessment of your, of your gift and I trust that he's going to um, give you, you know, position you where he thinks that you're going to function more uh, appropriately. And this is exactly the best way to do it. Um, you will also know if, um, if it's out of every other reason. For you, you know you've done your best, and suddenly he didn't just want to be very quiet, be patient, maybe over time. You may not be the one to speak. Somebody else may just take up your matter and say, oh, what is happening to the pastor? Talk to the pastor, what happened? Why have you decided to abandon our sister and our brother? It could just happen. Be prayerful. And of course, you must know that in a situation like this happen, the world is our parish. If, and if we are limited in our local assembly from functioning, um, let's take our responsibility wherever the Lord has given to us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, uh, sister, I want to contribute something, Sister Claudia. And after Sister Lucia, Paul will round up. Praise the Lord. Um, regarding um, evaluation on how we are performing, it is very good to ask somebody else. Um, how did I do? Because sometimes it's the territory is new and you're not familiar with it, like me and preaching. I've never preached anywhere. And the first time Sister Claire asked of me, I was like, are you sure? Is it God? Really? I really was not, at a lot, I don't think so. But I, after I did this, she says, oh, that was very good. I still was not, it's not that I'm not confident that I cannot speak, but I'm representing the things of God. I have to be very careful. I don't feed on compliments because the Bible says, uh, what God says, my glory will I not give nor or my praise to any graven images. So he will not share any compliments with us. So all the glory belongs to God. And I believe if the Holy Spirit is in us uh, fully, that we would not look. Flesh would tell us, how am I doing? The Holy Spirit would tell you how you are doing, how, I, how I'm doing. This is just my my evaluation, but um, don't look, if, if, if you ha want to volunteer in a particular area, and I, I realize most of us have different personalities, some people are more aggressive, some people are more subdued, in, in any society, in any given um, sect, you have people with those personalities, but we are all children of the most high, God, most high God, and there is the Holy Spirit within us, giving us a spirit of boldness within ourselves, that if someone did not call you, say, excuse me, sister, I really would like to volunteer or I would like to sing or whatever it is that, God, that you feel that the Lord is leading you. And um, if, if they're ignoring you, um, ask somebody else, not in gossip, but ask somebody else because when, when you do it that way, you, you, you're, you have love in your heart for that person. You have love in your heart for the ministry and God sees you. And it's God who saw Joshua I, and Pastor just pointed out God says, in whom the spirit of the Lord is. I said, wow. I never looked at it like that before. So the spirit of the Lord will lead people to you or lead you to people, but not to fish out compliments. Although sometimes the flesh wants, you know, to be recognized. That's my contribution. I thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. And my question, been, this question has been just on my mind uh, since about a year now. Here I, I got born again to know the way, this way of holiness. Um, my question is, if God called you, maybe you you born again as a, as a child of God, you confess all your sins to God and um, God, you know that this way, God wants to use you in this way, in, the, in another way maybe. God wants to use you in, uh, um, in the children group. God wants to use you in, a, in a singing. God wants to maybe uh, in the activities in the church. And in your area, you don't find anywhere church to go. You, there's no church you can go. There's no holiness church. There may, be, there may be church in your area. There may not be, uh, it may not be holiness church. 
and you now know that and God is telling you, my I want you to do this for me. I want you to do this for me. Um there's no choice you can go, but um you now find yourself that ah, what do I do? No good church. So I want to ask a question. Is it a sin? Maybe because in the Bible I read it where God gave uh he gave some ten talents, he gave some two talents, he gave many you know, the way he liked, the way he loved it, he shared, he gave them the talents. But some they not use their talents, some use it. But those who don't have privilege to go to a church in your area, maybe in the I'm sorry, that's my voice when I'm speaking sometime, when I'm speaking, my, my voice, I'm sorry. So, and uh, there's no choice you can go. And when maybe, is there a sin for as a child of God not to use your talent because you don't have good touch to go, but there's no anything you can do, no good touch. So I want to have this question because I've been disturbing my mind. Is there a sin as a child of God? Because God asks you to sing for you. God asks you to, to minister in the children group. There's no way you can find no, no good church. Is there a sin for you as a child of God? Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, let me first say that I'm so, it's so interesting for me to hear uh, my sister saying for about one, one year now you're born again and uh, you come to understand the holiness. Quite interesting because uh, these days you don't hear this. Because everybody believes they're born again and they've been old, born again as old as the church. So I'm so, so glad to hear this. Now, what you just raised now um, is a matter of great concern to so many people, and it's something that we need uh, the Lord to help us because we can go on and on with uh, self condemnation. And um, like you've just expressed now, it's a great war in your heart. A God is a master planner. And the moment you begin to realize that you have gift in you, the gift in you begin to speak up. There's a consciousness in you that there's something in you that's requesting for service. And you look around you, and you don't seem to find the best place to express it. That becomes, what you need to do is take it up. I don't know how long it's going to take you. It might take you one week. It might take one month. It might take three months. It might take six months. We just had a prayer meeting this evening. Um, and um, the preacher was talking about delays. He's a patient God. All you need to do is to take For you, God may just bring it, maybe, maybe prayer or singing or teaching. Be sensitive when God begins to bring somebody close to you because you are praying, you become more sensitive spiritually and see that God is asking you and this woman, this man, this people, and this girl to just begin to meet together, it takes time to it. Even if it's not there, when you begin to speak, the Bible 